two bass locking. I'm back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, guys, I've been gone for a while. How you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Uh, 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 my first wife gave me COVID. Uh, she betrayed me, so that sucked. Uh, but while Jane S was teaching, we spent a lot of time writing papers and grants and things like that. Nice. So and your, your show has been crushing. That's what I've yeah, been hearing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And how's your girlfriend? She's doing well. She was uh, last weekend. She was at the lab. She was she wanted to find out who's giving flowers and who's uh, Abby met her and Kyle also met her. So she's still pissed. Yeah. Yeah. She's trying, to, she's trying to get to the bottom of it. Yeah. I mean, it's on you. You have to handle it. <laughs> What do you mean it's on me? I mean, it's on you gave me this gig, so I'm transferring. Okay, there's that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, guys, let's get started. Um, get the right slides. So, uh, again, administrative stuff. Homework 5 is out. It's going to be due on December 3rd. Uh, and then, so that's in two weeks. Project 4 is out. That'll be due on December 10th. And we'll be announcing the, the info session for that uh, on Piazza, I think, this week. Um, and then on the last week of class, it's going to be two special lectures. So we're going to have somebody from Single Store come on over in Zoom uh, and talk about uh, the, the Single Store database system. They're going to have a heavy emphasis on LLMs or vector database stuff that they're building in Single Store. Again, that'll be over at Zoom, so we don't have to come here for that. Um, so please, please attend that. And then on the very last day of the class, on Wednesday, December 6th, we're going to do the final exam review. Uh, but then we're also going to do something we call the, the system speed run. So I'll post a form on Piazza. Go select or go put in what are some like some databases that we don't really cover during the semester that you want to learn about. We'll try to cover 10, you know, maybe like it's 120 minutes. We'll cover like one database in 10 minutes or like a crash course. Like here's what this system does. Here's why it's interesting. Here's why it matters. Or here's why it's stupid. And we'll try to get through as many systems as we can. Okay. Uh, so I, every year it's always like Mongo's number one, Spanner's number two. Uh, but if you guys want to do something more challenging, again, we'll look at, I'll send a link on the, to DBDBIO, pick any random stuff that you want. Okay. And then the final exam has been scheduled. I don't know where, but it's going to be on Tuesday, December 12th at 8.30 AM. And again, if you need any accommodations or if you have three exams scheduled in a 25 hour period, according to university policies, email Jagnesh and myself and we'll, we'll reschedule you for the makeup exam. Okay. Any questions about any of these things? All right, so then the, for the seminar series we're having this semester, we have two last talks. The talk today is actually super exciting. We're going to have somebody from Amazon talk about PG Vector. PG Vector is the most popular uh, vector extension for, for Postgres. So you don't need to use Weave 8 or Millivis or Pinecone. You can do some of those operations directly inside of Postgres. So they'll talk about how that works. And then next week will be a, uh, uh, the last talk will be a new database startup out of San Francisco called Chroma. That is, again, it was one of these specialized vector databases. OK? Again, all, all that's over Zoom. All right, so at this point in the semester, we've covered everything you need to know at a high level of how to build a single node database system. Right? We covered like at the lowest level, at the storage layer. We talked about how to bring things in and out of memory. We talked about how to actually run queries, uh, do query planning, turn, take a SQL query and turn it into an actual physical plan. And then we went back and crossed the entire stack, and now then we added recovery. We talked about how to handle through uh, Red Hat logging or or um, or other methods to be able to recover the database after a crash. We talked about how to have multiple transactions run at the same time and update the database through concurrency control. Right, all that everything you know. These topics here again, we didn't we didn't go too deep in any any one thing, but this is basically what you need to build a single node database system. So at this point in the semester. We're going to build upon what we've done so far, and now we're talking about distributed databases. Right? It's hard enough to build a, sing a single node database by itself. It's even harder to build a distributed one. All right? And there's going to be a bunch of these different design decisions we're going to have to make about how we want these different nodes to coordinate with each other, or how they're going to talk to each other, um, and how they're going to work together to execute queries, execute transactions. Um, and so like, you, know, you could have things come from the top and coordinate send messages to the top. You could go through the bottom. You could go through the middle. Right? There's all these different design choices you could have of how, how to build a distributed database system. Um, but it, at, at its core, it's going to be doing all the things that we've talked about this semester. Right? There's still going to be a disk. You're still going to have to read things you know, in, in a buffer pool. But now when you run a query, do you, are you going to send messages to another node to run part of the query over there? Should you pull data from that they have? Or is there a central location you can go get data from? And so we only have three classes to discuss distributed databases. So obviously, this is going to be a crash course in this topic. Um, but again, the, 
hopefully what you'll get out of this is a, a way to assess real world systems because you understand the vernacular, the vocabulary of what these systems are talking about and how they're implemented. And that'll help you make different design decisions when you, you know, if you, if you ever want to build one yourself or need to start using one in the real world. Okay. So we showed this slide early in the semester where we discussed uh, parallel query execution that we made this, this distinction between parallel database systems and distributed databases. Right? We said the parallel databases are ones where the, the nodes are physically close to each other. Like think of like you know, different CPU so uh, sockets or different CPUs that are, are running different, in different the, sorry, the, they're running separate instances of the database system and they communicate over some high speed interconnect or they're running in like they're in the same rack and you know, it, it looks like just one giant shared machine, all right? So the big thing about in a, in a parallel database system is that we're gonna assume that the communication cost is gonna be small, like nanoseconds or microseconds to send a message from one worker to another. And we're also gonna assume that the communication is reliable, meaning like if I send a message to another thread, that thread's gonna get that, you know, modulo any like software errors, but like it's not, the message, it's not gonna get disappeared. Right? But now in the distributed database system world, we can't make those assumptions. We can't assume that the nodes are gonna be close to each other. We can't assume that one node or one worker talking to another worker is, is cheap, right? Because you could either be in, the, you know, ideally in the same rack, but maybe you're, you know, in the same data center, but the same different availability zone. Or the worst case scenario is that you're in completely two different data centers and one database node is on the other opposite and, and the planet. And now you're, you're constricted by speed of light issues which you can't, you know, you, there's no magic wand to make that go away. So the other, so in addition to the communication between nodes being expensive, the communication could be unreliable, All right? TCP IP will help a bunch of things, make sure that the packets end up in order, but there's no guarantee that if we send a message that the other side is actually going to get it, right? Or it might get it in different orders, right? Not because the network gets severed, but like say the node itself starts doing something weird. Like if say it's a, it's a Java based database system and then the garbage collector kicks in. So there's like, you know, a 30 second pause cause it's cleaning up the heap. But now the node looks un, un, unavailable and now messages might, when it, when it flips back on, messages might show up in different orders. So all these reasons, you know, the, the, we have to account for all these things in our, in our, in our distributed database system. We can't assume the hardware is going to hide it for us in the, in the same way we can for parallel databases. So this is just repeating what I said before, but we can use all the building blocks of a single node data system that, we, that we, we've constructed so far, and now we can, we can layer on top of that and say, okay, here's how we want to distribute the execution across multiple physical nodes, right? And we can do this for OTP systems, like running transactional workloads, and for analytical workloads. So today's class is going to be a high level of like, here's what a distributed database looks like. Here's the things you have to, you have to worry about. N then next class after the break will be entirely about distributed transaction systems, and then we'll cover distributed OLAP systems or analytical systems. And 721 next semester will be entirely on analytical systems. So in a distributed environment, everything is just harder. Optimization and query planning, that was hard enough. On a single node, it's, it's even harder in a uh, distributed system because now you, have, you, have, you may not be sure what data is actually at another node or how, how fast can you communicate between them. Currency control is gonna be the, probably the, the hardest part of all this. How do we make sure that the different nodes that are involved in a transaction all agree that a transaction can commit? Then when we say, yes, let's go commit, they all actually did that, right? So it's basically a distributed state machine if you take in uh, distributed algorithms or distributed systems. And then logging recovery, again, how do we make sure that if, a, if one of our nodes in our system crashes, ideally we don't want that, that, that to take down our entire system, right? If our, if our distributed database is like 20 nodes and one of them goes down, we don't want the other 19 to be uh, completely you know, locked until that thing comes back up because it might never come back up, right? So again, we'll, we'll touch on all these things as we go along. We won't really talk about uh, query optimization too much. We'll talk a little bit about it next week. All right, so for today's class, we're gonna first talk about like, the high level overview of what the of distributed system architecture could look like in the context of databases. Then we'll talk about the design issues we have to worry about when we actually implement one of these things. Then we'll talk about how we want to partition our, our database so we can split it, up, split it up across multiple nodes. Again, we talked a little bit about that when we talked about parallel execution. And then we'll give a preview of why distributed concurrent control is hard, and that'll be a segue into uh, what we discuss next week. Okay? Okay. So let's start from the basics. 
So a distributed data system architecture is going to basically define where the resources are that are going to be available to the, the CPUs. Again, we're assuming a von Neumann architecture. There's things on disk, we bring it to the memory, and then there's a CPU that uses that memory to execute instructions and process data. So the discussion really, uh, when you just d design a distributed database system, is where's the, wh you know, where's the memory and where's the disk? And who's allowed to read and write to it at any given time? Right, and this is going to determine how the, the CPUs are going to coordinate and talk to each other, like what kind of messages are they going to send and when do they send them? And then who's going to be involved in deciding when certain things should happen? Again, if, we, if, if it's a transactional system, somebody's got to decide, OK, it's time to commit this transaction. Can everybody agree to that? And someone has to be, you know, be in charge of making that decision. So the architecture we've been mostly discussing so far, uh, actually entirely discussing this semester, is what is known in the, sort of the, the, the database literature as a shared everything system. Meaning there's a, on a single box, like a single node, it has local disk, it has local memory, and that, that machine can, or that, that, that database system can, can access all those things equally. All right, and there's, there's, no other, there's no other node, right? It's just, this is basically, this is what a single node database system, this is what BusTub is, or Postgres, or, or MySQL. Ig ignoring replication for now. But then when most people think of a distributed database system, they think of something like this, what is known as a shared nothing system, which is what is a, term invented in the 1980s by the guy who invented Postgres, Mike Sternberger. And this, again, this is what most people think about when you think of a distributed system, right? That there's individual nodes, and those nodes have CPUs, and those CPUs can access memory, it can ask, access local disk. But any time it wants to communicate with any other node in the, in the distributed database, it has to go through some network protocol. Again, for, for our purposes, assume it's TCP IP, and it sends messages to the different uh, to, you know, to, to the different nodes to coordinate with each other. What is more common now, especially in the cloud, is what is known as a shared disk system. And the idea here is that there's still individual nodes that have you know, CPUs and have local memory. They may even have direct attached uh, SSDs that could use for caching. But the primary storage location of the database is going to be on some shared disk. Right? You can think of like a giant NAS appliance, like some uh, you know, shared storage server, or if you're in the cloud, think of like S3, uh, or whatever, whatever the, the one from Azure GCP is. Right? That's, the, that's the resting place, the primary location of the database. In the case of a shared nothing system, the database could be replicated on, on every single node, uh, or we could partition it or break it up to, 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 to subsets and have each node be responsible for that. Right? But in a shared disk system, it looks like a single logical disk that every node can, can communicate with. I'll, I'll go through each of these more details, details with examples. Um, and just to be complete in the, in, the, in the research literature, there's also a category of systems called shared memory systems. Um, and the idea here is that the, the disk and memory is shared across some kind of fabric, and the, the CPU nodes or the, the, the database nodes can only coordinate or communicate through some, again, some kind of network. Again, this looks a lot like shared everything. Um, I'll, I'll show this in a slide in a second. but like. As far as I know, nobody actually does shared memory, right? It's, this, this architecture mostly exists in, um, in like high performance computing, where you want to sort of have a single like disaggregated memory pool, and all the nodes can can coordinate with that, through that. But again, as far as I know, no database system actually implements this. All right, so we're going to spend most of our time focusing on shared nothing and shared disk. So as I said, the, the term shared nothing uh, I think dates into like nineteen eighty six. The first shared nothing database system that was actually commercially available was Teradata, which I think is like 82, 83. Um, there were some academic prototypes that, that predate this, predate that, uh, but those, are actually, those, those were actually never, never, never actually implemented or used. But Teradata was sort of the first one. Right? Again, the idea here is that our, each node can't view the memory or disk of any other node in the cluster, and they can only communicate through the, through the through, the, you know, through some network. So the, the conventional wisdom is that in a shared nothing system, uh, this is going to give you better performance and better efficiency because now uh, if, if I shard or partition my database across these different nodes, then I can distribute a query, break it up into smaller pieces, have each node basically run full blast on all its local, local storage, local, local copy of the database, 
and then I somehow aggregate the, the results together in the same way we did for parallel execution using like, like, like an exchange operator, right? So this, is, this is, gets the best performance because you're not bottlenecked for any digital node. You're not bottlenecked in any other node because you're only accessing data that's local to you. Of course, as we know, in, in the real world, uh, you may have to talk to other nodes to get data that, that you're missing, and that, that becomes a, pr a problem. The challenge, though, and we'll see this in, con in contrast with uh, a shared disk system, is that in a shared nothing system, it's harder to scale capacity because the, the data you know, that's stored in the local disk is tied to each node. So if I want to add a new node uh, in, my, in my cluster, I got to copy data from other nodes to be able to, to spread it out. It's also going to be harder to ensure consistency because, again, since every node has their own local, local portion of the database, copy of the database, they can't see the memory of, of other nodes, then they got to send messages to ask, hey, hey, what are you doing for this transaction? Or, hey, what are you doing for this query? So there's a lot of databases that use this architecture. And as I said, the, this was the conventional wisdom of how you build a, a scalable distributed database system up until maybe the last 10 years or so. Right, the cloud changes. But if you're going to build a distributed database in the 80s or 90s, early 2000s, uh, you, you would use this approach. Yes? So, so each of these disks, they have, you said they have a portion of the database? Potentially, yes. Depends on how you want to partition it. We'll, we'll get that in a second. So if the, like, let's say the, the first CPU wants to get something from the third disk, it goes to the network and... You got to go through the network and bring it over, yeah. Like, there's no, his question is like, assuming, say, like, say the database is just... You, We'll talk about how to do partitioning in a second. But like, you literally just take a, one column, hash it, the value, and then you distribute it out to, across the different nodes, right? You make a face. But it's, that, that's very common, right? And it's actually a good idea. We'll see that. But that he's ba so basically, you know, this node one has, has, has some range. The next node has the next range. I'll actually show the next slide. Like, if, I, if my node here needs to get the data that this node has, I can't just peek over to the disk. I got to send a message and say, hey, send me the data you have. Right? Oh, so, so the query goes to all of the CPUs? Uh, his question is, does the query go to all three CPUs? If, if you need all the data at all, this, all the CPUs, yes. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get in a second. Like, there's, there's going to be some, there's some intelligence to say, OK, you look at the query, and it's declarative, so I know what you're trying to do. Find me the minimal number of nodes that has the data that I need. Right? Well, next slide. All right. So say we have a really simple distributed database, two node cluster, shared nothing. Again, so on each node, there's a local CPU, local memory, local disk. And then what I'm showing here is that I've taken a single table and I partitioned it uh, based on the value of an ID column. So it's the primary key. And so the first partition at the top is going to have all the, the tuples where ID is equals 1 to 150. And the one at the bottom has all tuples where ID is 151 to 300. Right? This is an example of range partitioning. Um, I said hash partitioning is another approach. We'll, we'll see that in a second. But like, but now, you know, depending on what my query is, depending on what data I need to access, I would use this information to figure out what which of these nodes I need to go to. And the way I'm going to figure out what 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 node I need to go to is through some kind of catalog or metadata service. And I'm showing this as, as a cloud because it could be on the actual nodes themselves. Or it could be like a third-party external service on the side that says, okay, where do I actually need to, need to get this data, right? Different systems do different things. So I'm just showing, saying this, it's, this is a amorphous thing that somehow is going to tell us in our application where should we go. So now say my query is gets, get ID equals 200. Based on the information I've gotten from the, the catalog, uh, I know that this node at the bottom has the, 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 all the tuples where ID is 151 to 300. ID two, equals 200 is in that range, so I know I want to come here and get the data that I need. Now when I execute this query on, the, on this node down here, I don't need to communicate with the node at the top because it doesn't have any of the data that I need. Everything is down here. Right? And then at the same time, I have another query that comes along and say this one wants to get ID equals 100 and ID, ID equals 200. So we'll talk about data transparency in a second, but Ideally, we don't want the application server to be aware and be in charge of deciding how to get the data that it needs for a particular query. Meaning, I just want to send my query request for these two IDs to this node and then have this node figure out, so the one at the top, figure out how to get the data that it needs to process this query. And so it could be the case that the, uh, in this example here, 
I send a message from the top node to the bottom node, hey, I have a query up here that needs, needs to get ID equals 200. S send me that data up, send that data up to me. Let me click this out, okay. Um, right, and then, I, then I, I can return the response to, to the server. Is this clear? Yes. Um, if we're doing aggregation, for example, uh, so we don't want the application server to do a lot of the heavy lifting. That's what you mean. You still have to do this to it. Yeah, so, so the statement is, um, if you're doing aggregation where you, well, the, just an example where you need to touch data at both partitions or both nodes, you, you want the database server to do that for you, not the application server. Yes. And so we'll see this in a second. You could have something in front of this, a middleware, a coordinator, that the query shows up there, and then it knows here's the data that I need. And if I have to then combine results, it can decide, okay, well, most of the data I need is on the node here, so I want to I want to maybe just pull a small amount of data from the bottom to the top, because that's gonna be cheaper. We'll see this push versus pull in a second. Another question? Uh, I was wondering if the top node should talk to the metadata also. Yeah, so like his question is, should the top node also talk to this metadata service? Yes. Like it has to be Again, it's going to have to be ideally, well, yeah, no, I, yes, ideally. So you want this all to be basically a transactional. So like if, if something gets added or new data changes or the ranges changes, I want to do this in a transactional safe manner because then I can guarantee that anybody comes along and looks for an ID, if I start moving things around, it, 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 it gets the right answer. We'll see how Mongo did it wrong in a second. Yes. All right. So. Now let's say I want to add, I, I, I have a lot, lot of activity on my database node. I need to add more, more, you know, more servers because I'm, you know, my, my latency is too high. I'm getting too many queries. I, I want to scale up, or sorry, scale out. So I want to add a new, new node here. But again, when it boots up, there's, it's, there's no data inside of it. So now I, I need to start getting data from the other nodes in order to fill in the, the you know, fill in the disk and start be, be able to process queries. So in this case here, you have to have the top guy and the bottom guy. For simplicity, assume they're going to they're going to split this range uh, in half by equally. So uh, ID from you know 150, 101 to 150 down here, and from uh, what well, was what before? It was um, sorry. Uh, it was 151, 300. So we'll, we'll move 151 and 200 up here, right? And then to his question over here, I update the catalog surface. By the way. This data, I, you know, this new node exists. Here's the ranges that it has. So that any new query comes along, says, okay, where can I find the data I'm looking for? It will see a consistent view of the, of, of the catalog. And I was said before that MongoDB did it wrong. So MongoDB had this auto sh scaling thing, and in, in, I think they still have it. But the, the early versions of MongoDB, one, one of the big selling points is that they could do auto scaling. So if, if, you're, if your partitions or nodes are getting too hot, it can split the ranges up for you automatically. But they didn't, they didn't move data around in a transactionally safe manner. So they would do this copying that I'm showing here, but they couldn't guarantee that the catalog would be uh, synchronized when, it, when this change occurred. So there may be a, like a small window where you could actually have a false negative where the catalog wasn't updated yet. Your, your query goes up here to the top node because you're looking for ID 150, but the data hasn't moved yet. Or sorry, the data was moved, but you didn't have the, ca the catalog, uh, so you, it points you to the top one, and then that node says it's not, it's not there. So uh, this, the reason why I'm highlighting this metadata stuff is it's just another transaction. We want to have a consistent view of the database, and not just mean, not just mean what data is sorry what the data looks like on each individual node, but a, the, the the metadata itself that tells you where that data is located. We want that to be transactional as well. All right, so shared disk, as I said, the cloud uh, has really made this the, 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 the most popular way to build a database system now. Shared disk, and the, this architecture was, was first designed in the 1980s, but a lot of the systems that were based on this architecture didn't, didn't pan out. It was a huge pain, pain to build uh, and became very unreliable. Um, but the cloud changes that now. So again, because the shared disk isn't just going to be something that we as the database system developer have to build, although some systems choose to do that, you, we just rely on the massive infrastructure of the cloud vendors uh, and use that as our, as our backing storage, right? So like you could use Amazon S3, right? That's basically infinite disk, 
right? So you never have to worry about scaling or, or provisioning new, new, new storage. Amazon has infinite storage for you, right? Or I mean, basically infinite. Like if you get to the point where you're, you start running out of space on S3, you're going to get calls from Amazon way before that even happens, right? Your credit card is going get, to get denied. Uh, you can also use a distributed file system. HDFS is a bad example, but that's something like you could use. But there's better ones now that, that you could use as the backing store. But it's not just in this architecture, it's not enough just to say, OK, let me take my single node bus tub or single node Postgres and make it stick, it stick it on a distributed file system. The database system itself needs to be aware that it's talking to a distributed file system. Because there are some optimizations you can do. Uh, and there's some, obviously, some logic would make sure that you don't have two guys trying to write to the same file at the same time. Because they're doing transactions that because they don't but they don't know about about each other, right? So it's not just enough to say have a distributed file system. You have to have the the, the compute nodes be aware that they are part of a, a larger system. So the nice advantage of using this approach is that you can now scale the two the, the, the two parts of the data system independently. So if I need more compute, I just add new compute nodes, and the compute nodes are stateless. So it's not like I need to copy data between the different nodes as I did in the shared nothing system. They'll just pull data from the, from the shared disk. Now, I still need to update my metadata to say who's responsible for what portion of, of the database, uh, if, especially if it's a transactional system. But that's way easier than a shared nothing system. We can still use uh, direct attack storage. So even though I'm not showing it in the boxes here at the top, uh, where's my pointer? Sorry, new, new clicker. So we, you can't even see. All right. So, even though the nodes themselves, I'm not showing a disk, it can have a local SSD as well. And we can just use that as a bigger, slower cache. So like right now, your buffer pool basically writes out the disk in bus tub, and that the disk is the final location of the database. But I could have another stage in my buffer pool where I could, I could write things out to the SSD and then manage that as if it was just DRAM and do eviction and, and throw things out of that as well. So when people talk about data lakes, they, tip, they mean this architecture. The data lake stuff is interesting. We can cover this next week because the idea is that instead of all the write path for all updates to the database going through the database system, I can just write things out to S3. And then there's some metadata service like the Hive Metastore. I think Databricks calls theirs Unity. Right? There's some catalog service that, that, can, that you can update and say, hey, by the way, I have a bunch of these CSV files or Parquet files on disk. And then and now it knows how to incorporate them or use them when you execute queries. But it's still, it's still going to be a shared disk architecture. Or when people say they have a serverless database, it typically means this as well. Because again, the compute nodes are stateless. The final resting place of the database, which is what we care about, is here on the shared disk, or on S3 or whatever it is. So now if, if, if I spin up my database system, I haven't any, executed any queries on, it, on, the, on the, the database system for an hour, well, I can just shut off the compute nodes. And in a shared disk system, or sorry, in a shared nothing system, the database would go away because, again, the disk was attached to, the, to, to each node. So if I turn the node off, the, the database is, that, you know, that portion of the data is no longer available. But in a shared disk system, I shut the compute node off, who can, and S3, you know, all my data is still in S3. And then if, you know, an hour later, if, if I want to execute another query, then I spin up another compute node and start pulling data from the, the shared disk storage. It's basically how a, a serverless database works. So there's a lot of systems that implement this as well, both for transactional systems and for OLAP systems. Uh, and as I said, most of the newer database systems designed in the probably last five years are using this architecture. And then a bunch of systems that were maybe originally shared nothing have since come around and actually retrofitted or refactored their code to, to become a shared disk system. All right, so here, here's that same, uh, yes, question. So the question is, do these systems rewrite the entire server backend, like for storage, or? Did, yeah, I mean, so, so, yeah, so, so, if you're relying on S3, you don't have to, you know, technically you don't have to build something that you know reads and writes disk like a, like a, you still need a disk manager, right? But that disk manager isn't writing to local storage; it's just coding writing data to S3. Now, I made a big deal beginning of the semester. I said like, oh, the OS is terrible. We don't trust the OS for anything. But now I'm saying we're going to trust Amazon, right? Um, yes. yes. So you can think of S3 as just being, it's just, from our perspective, it's just another disk. 
it's bigger, slower. It's not directly attached, but from the data center perspective, it's just another disk. Now, there's some things you can do with like using S3 as an example that you can't do it with a regular disk. You can do some predicate pushdown. So in S3, for example, you can actually run select queries on S3, and it'll S3 can natively like parse a CSV or JSON file and run part of your query down there. So it's a, it's a little bit more sophisticated than, than a dumb disk, but from our perspective on the database system, it's just a disk, right? So we're still gonna, man, we, we're still gonna be responsible for deciding when things get written out, what gets brought into to memory. If we have a multi-stage cache, where, do that, where does that go? How do we decide how to split all the data up? All that we have to manage ourselves. That doesn't go away. Yes? The question is, is there any benefit to doing this on your own versus using S3? Uh, yeah, I mean, could, you, could, could you get better than S3? Absolutely, yes. And some systems do that, right? Uh, wait, there's like, do I want to run my own distributed, sh distributed disk or distributed file system? And then, that's, so that's one, that's one aspect of, of what you could rewrite. Very few people would do that. Because again, Amazon is Amazon. They have hundreds of engineers working on this. Uh, and like I said, it's infinite disk. You don't have to provision anything yourselves. You pay more for it, right? And the latency can be like 50 to 200 milliseconds sometimes. That's a lot. So, but like they handle replication for you, right? Which can be good or bad, right? The, again, if the data system is aware that it's written to S3 and that S3 is going to replicate itself, then you maybe you don't have to, the data system itself doesn't have to do replication. So that's, that's one aspect of this. Um, then the, then the, do you want to rely on Amazon's libraries to talk to S3? And there's one data, it's Yellowbrick. Uh, they gave a talk with us a few years ago where they were like, we tried all the Amazon libraries. They're all crap. And they rewrote everything for themselves. And they did kernel bypass to, to make, you know, reason writes, puts and gets to S3 even faster than what Amazon will give you. So there's, there's various levels of, of optimizations you can do before like, okay, let me run my own S3. But I think the, the having the ability to do predicate pushdown um, in S in S three, I don't think I think uh, Microsoft supports that. I don't think Google does, or one of them supports it. But like, be able to do some p predicate pushdown, that's a big win as well, because now I could be more selective on on bringing back data that it, maybe I don't need. What are the downsides of this compared to shared nothing? What what are the downsides of this to share nothing? Yeah. Um, We'll see this in a second. Uh, actually, let me go to the next slide. The big challenge is going to be you almost always have to pull data from from disk into the compute to the, to the, the, the through the compute node. Again, it's called push pushing the, the query to the data or pulling the data to the query. In a shared nothing system, you can make that decision, and you almost always can uh, push the query to the data. So even if you can't push the entire query, like I, I can do some predicate pushdown. That's better than just blindly grabbing blocks and fetching them. That's the key difference, right? But the, the not having to worry about how to do replication and all these other things that Amazon takes care of for you, that's a, that's a big enough win, and the speeds have gone, gotten so much faster that like, it's just you, it's worth paying that penalty. All right, so let's go back to our example here. All right, so now, uh, my, my, my application server runs a query, says gets ID 101. The, the node can go to the catalog service and figure out where, where to find that data. Uh, like, again, it's, what bucket on S3 ha has the data that I need. And then now, when it accesses storage, it's not. Just like before, in a buffer manager, you have to convert the, the record you're looking for to a page number, or a block number, or a bucket number, or a segment, or whatever you want to call it, to go out to the disk and, and go get it. And then it copies it into the local memory of this node, who then compute the, the query and produce the answer to once. Right? Same thing with this guy down here. Again, he can go get the, the you know, get ID equal one or two, goes fetches that page, and then processes the query. So now if I want to add a new capacity, I want to add a new compute node, again, these nodes are stateless. Uh, meaning the primary location of the database is not in the compute nodes, it's all on shared disk. So even though these nodes may have cache copies of pages, which you'd want to do because you, you, know, you, you pay money every time you go look things up on Amazon, it's, you know, they're not, you know, it's, it's a temporary lease, temporary ownership. So I could spin up this new node, uh, 
not have to copy any data between my uh, my other nodes potentially, um, and then I, then a new query can show up and this thing go gets the data that it needs. And then if I want to scale, add more disk, what do I do? Well, actually, I'll, let's do an update first. So if I do an update here, 101. So since uh, this node here has a copy of it, uh, I have to make the, make the modification to the sh uh, to the shared disk. Um, but then I maybe have to update everyone else. And say, oh, by the way, I know you have a cached copy of this uh, of this tuple. Here's the new version of it. Or it's, it's, you know whatever version you have now has been invalidated. Go back to the shared disk and go, go get the new version. Yes. So question: How does the top node that the how does the top node know that the bottom two nodes have a cache copy of this? So we'll see this in a second. In the shared disk system, you, we, we're doing that partitioning, but it's logical, and we're just saying that the the a one node is going to be responsible for handling the rights to another node, and then if another node wants to uh, get a you know also get a copy of it, it could either go to it has to tell somebody, hey, by the way, I'm you know, I know you have a copy. You're the you're the owner for this for this record or this partition. Give me a copy of what you have, and then now this guy knows that the bottom guy has a copy of it and so can can update it. Or you could tell the the catalog server, hey, by the way, like I need to copy it. Or you just broadcast to everyone like a gossip protocol and say, hey, go go get go get the latest version. And then now I, we talk about isolation levels. We'll talk about you know it's the same idea. Only do you want this is actually the C in acid, which we sort of danced over before. Do you want to have a consistent view of the entire database? Yes or no. If you want a consistent view, then you got to make sure that that anyone could possibly have a copy gets this update. Here's a new version. Or if you're okay with things having stale reads, then I do my update, but then I eventually tell everyone else, "Hey, by the way, here's a new version of it." And it may be the case that any query that goes here and reads the old version, you know, that's okay. For some applications, that's okay. For others, not. It's not. Again, we'll, we'll cover that more next week. All right, if I want to add new storage capacity, psh, again, if, if it's S3, it's easy. <laughs> you just give Amazon more money, right? Uh, and they'll gladly, gladly take it. Uh, and you just get more storage capacity. Or even if it was managed by yourself, right? I can just add new disks to my distributed file system. And because these guys, these guys are stateless, it, it doesn't matter. I don't, I don't have to do any coordination there. All right, so I, I'm not going to say much about shared memory. Again, this is sort of like, the it's it's almost like a not theoretical because you could build one uh, and there's people have, have danced around building prototypes in the in the 80s and 90s uh, but there's again as far as I know no, there's no real system that actually does this and again the idea here is that you have these stateless compute nodes uh, and then there's some kind of shared disk thing but then the memory is also shared as well so anytime I want to go send messages to another node I just write to some memory address and there's some hardware that magically makes sure that Every, everyone gets the update. Um, it looks a lot like shared everything. It's just the distinction is that I'm saying there's tip, there's there's separate physical nodes, and there's some interconnect like RDMA or something like that to, or Finiband so that they can talk to each other. All right, but again, no, nobody actually does this as far as I know. All right, so I, I, I sort of mentioned this before, but there's a uh, distributed the idea of a distributed database is old. Uh, it goes back to the 1970s. So as far as I know, the, the first two prototypes of, of distributed databases were uh, this thing called Muffin. Um, it stands for multiple something or something of Ingress. Right? It's the guy that built Ingress and Postgres, Stonebreaker. They have a sort of a tech report paper out of Berkeley that describes here's how you could build a distributed version of, of Ingress. The more famous one is SCD1 by Phil Bernstein. Um, Phil Bernstein did a lot of the, the great initial work on how to do concurrent control in, in distributed databases. Um, but he gave a talk once at a workshop I was running where he talked about SCD1 actually wasn't a real system. It was a bunch of scripts that, do, that, 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 that could build like a prototype so they could like not trick the government, like show the government, hey, we can we can actually do this, and they got money from it. But they actually never built the real system. Um, IBM built a version of uh, a version of System R, the first relational system that they were building, called System R Star. Gamma is a um, was an early prototype of uh, of a distributed database at a University of Wisconsin uh, from in the 1980s. Actually, it was built by Jignesh's PhD advisor at Wisconsin. But the only one of these that actually is still around today is this thing called Nonstop SQL from Tandem, uh, and that was Jim Gray's one of the projects that Jim Gray worked on at, at Tandem. 
Jim Gray, again, won the Turing Award for databases in the 1980s. He invented two-phase locking and a bunch of other stuff we've discussed, it, we've discussed this semester. He left IBM to go to Tandem, but I think he had a non-compete clause where he wasn't allowed to work on databases for five years or something like that. And then w nonstop was building this super fault-tolerant hardware. Think of like NASA level fault tolerance, like there's like two CPUs running and they're running the same computation and they check to see whether they get the same result. Like this is obviously big in banks in the 80s and even today. But Tandem Nonstop SQL is still around today. If you ever use an ATM machine, chances are your transaction is going to go through nonstop or IMS from IBM, like, but you're, you're going through some old systems. Uh, Muffin was uh, uh, multiple faster, faster ingress. Uh, and then I asked Mike once when I was like, yeah, that, that's what they had to put in the paper. But he really said that the real name was <laughs> ingress. Uh, so they called it muffin. Uh, it, you, Mike doesn't curse that much. I was surprised when he said that. Anyway. All right. So you guys answered a bunch of these questions. And we've been sort of dancing around these things. And now it's start time to talk about okay, how are we actually going to do these things. Uh, so we know what the high-level architecture looks like. So now we've got to talk about how we're going to actually run queries and execute transactions. So one of the first things that came out was like, okay, how does the application find the data? In my examples, I said there was this catalog service. Uh, that's one way to do it. And then, then, then the application can decide where I actually want to go themselves. Or we can see another approach where there's just a single coordinator, a single URL that, that everybody talks to, and that thing is, is, knows where all the data it needs. And likewise, where does it actually send the data? Sorry, sorry, send the queries. Do I send it to that coordinator? Do I send it to individual nodes? Does the application is it even aware of those individual nodes? Ideally, no. And then we want to execute queries and say the data that we need is not on a single disk or a single node. What do we do? Right? And again, the two approaches are do I want to push the query to the data or some portion of the query to the data where it resides, some processing, and get back a subset of the results? Or do I want to pull all the data that I need from a node to another node and process the query there? How are we going to make sure that if we execute transactions that update data at multiple locations, and then we say commit, that it actually commits, uh, and everyone's in sync at the same time about, you know, and, and agrees, well, these are the changes that, that are getting made. And then how are we going to decide if we want to split the database across different resources? This is the partitioning stuff I was saying before. So as always, in all parts of systems, especially in databases, we're going to have to make trade-offs. All right, because we're not going to be able to guarantee that our database system is going to be online all the time, going to answer any possible query especially if, if nodes start going down and messages start getting lost and we can't communicate between nodes. So we have to make a decision on what should we do. Right? Should we produce incorrect, incorrect results or should we just stop everything until we can get back online? So next class, we're going to focus on this. Again, how do we ensure correctness? How do we make sure that we can coordinate transactions across multiple nodes? The, the, the TLDR is going to be something like Paxos or two-phase commit or raft, if you're, if you're familiar with those protocols. Um, but then we have to handle replication and other things. All right, so the first decision we've got to make is what should the nodes actually do? And the two approaches are you have homogeneous nodes or heterogeneous nodes. And so what I've shown so far are more or less homogeneous nodes where every node in our, in our database system cluster can do any task. Uh, meaning I can send a query to any, any node, and that node can then figure out, OK, where's the data that I need? You know, how do I send it to, to that location or get the data that I need to put it back together, right? And what is nice about this approach is that it makes provisioning the, the, the resources you need for your database cluster easy. And if, you, and if a node goes down and you spin up a new one, it, it, just, it just replaces the, you know, fits in with the rest of the, the, the systems, and you, or, sorry, the rest of the nodes, and you don't have to worry about rebalancing who's doing what. In a homogeneous architecture, you have nodes be assigned to specific tasks. And I've already alluded to this already. You could say you could have this catalog service as a separate node. You could have a coordinator node or middleware as a separate node, right? And then you make decisions about what's going to be stateless, what's going to be stateful, and should I have multiple sort of virtual nodes assigned to a single physical node so that you know one box can do multiple things. But now if that, that box goes down, which it will in a real system, then how do I decide where to place the new task or to, to fail over to the new task, right? Again, d different systems do different things. I would say in the cloud architecture, the, the heterogeneous approach is more common now with a, with a coordinator or middleware sitting in front of the, the rest of the compute nodes. Like this is what Snowflake will give you. 
Databricks, and, and, and others. But some of the NoSQL systems like Cassandra, for example, uh, or these distributed key value stores, there'll be homogeneous nodes. I, I don't actually, I don't, I don't want to give the impression that like if you're NoSQL, you're homogeneous. If, if you're SQL or relational, you're heterogeneous. Everybody does something different. And I'm not saying one, one approach is better than another. All right, we already talked about data transparency. Again, the idea is that we don't want our application to be aware or know where the data is actually located uh, and where the, the, the physical nodes are, are, are. Now, in some, some ways, at a high level, you kind of need to be aware of where your data actually is. Uh, like, if I'm going to run a, a, you know, an expensive query, I don't want to do a, a, you know, a, a two petabyte join between data that's in, you know, uh, you know, across the country and a data that's in my local data center, because that's going to be super expensive. Now, if it's unavoidable, sure, right? But it, you know, you don't want people just to be too loosey goosey with sending whatever query that they want. Some high level understanding of where th actually things are, but like the exact you know physical address of what data is at what partition. Ideally, we, we want all that to be hidden, so that the same SQL query that someone builds, uh, to, you know, that runs today, could run the next day, even though the the physical nodes have been have been reorganized or data move, has moved around because I've re I've re rebalanced. So again, I don't want ideally not to have you know, specific hints or physical location of where hints or keywords inside my SQL queries. I want to have all that abstracted away and let, let the data system decide the best way to handle all that. All right, so now let's talk about how we want to split our database up. So again, it's just like in a parallel database that we talked before, where we want to divide, divide our database across into disjoint subsets so that I can take advantage of, the system can take advantage of all the additional hardware that's available to us, right? I don't want to you know, pay you know, for 100 machines in my database system, my distributed database system, but then only be able to use one of them or two of them, right? That'd be stupid and, and a waste of money. So I'm going to use the term partitioning in the relational database world or in academic world. That's the term we use. If you ever read documentation about the NoSQL systems or other open source distributed databases, they might say the term sharding. The, the idea is basically the same. We're going to break the database into disjoint subsets, and we're going to store them on you know, those subsets in, to different locations. And then now, just like in a parallel database, my query shows up. I may want to break it up into the query plan into to query fragments and distribute those fragments to the different compute nodes and have them uh, execute on the partitions that they have. And then there'll be some exchange operator, some way to coalesce results and produce a single answer back to, to the application. So because again, I don't want to have to. I, my, I don't want to rewrite my SQL query if I add new nodes or, or take away nodes. The same SQL query that works on a machine, you know, a, a distributed database with ten nodes should work on also with hundred nodes, without having to do, make any changes. So the database system is going to be able to partition the, da the database physically if it's shared nothing, because again we have to physically divide it up across different nodes, or logically in a shared disk system, because again those compute nodes are technically sort of stateless. Uh, and they're pulling data from the shared disk, shared disk layer, but I would still want to know who's responsible for what portion or what partition of, of the shared disk. All right, so we'll talk about different ways to do partitioning. So the, the most naive approach or the, the simplest approach is called simple table partitioning. Uh, this is not that common. I know Mongo does this. I, I don't know what other systems do. But the idea here is you basically just say, all right, this table, its entire contents goes to this node, and this other table goes to this other node. And this works great if you don't do joins across those two tables. Uh, and, and, and most of your operations on the tables are, are very fast and only touching a small amount of data. Because um, then you can make sure that your, the load of the, the, the application is spread across different, uh, the different nodes. I right, so see a really simple example. I have two tables. So I'm going to take uh, just color code them. All the, the rows or tuples from partition table one goes to the first partition. All the tuples from, from table two goes to the second partition. And then in my ideal scenario of any query that just looks at only one of those tables, no joins, this, this will be OK. Again, assuming that you know, there could be hot spots and other issues, but for simplicity, we, we can ignore that. So in the case of Mongo, the example they told me, the reason why they supported this is that they had some customers where they, had the, they wanted to do horizontal partitioning, we'll, we'll see in a second, across most of the tables, but they had one table that was like, almost like a, 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 an application log. So anytime there was, there was a change, they would write, you know, insert a new record into that, that table. 
and it, you never actually read it. You just want you just wanted to write it. So they would they, to ensure that that write operation didn't interfere with other partitions. It would just all go to a, a single single node. For them, that worked. Our vertical partitioning is like a way to do like a poor man's uh, column store. Um, and the idea here is that we're going to split the a table uh, based on the actual attributes themselves, but not the values of them, but rather just the entire column and the entire, you know, all the, all the values for a given attribute. So let's say in this case here, we have a table that has four columns. The first three columns are 32-bit integers, so that they're small, they're cheap. But then I have a fourth attribute that's a text field. And maybe this is at least like 10 megabytes or something like that. Um, but most of my queries only want to access the first three attributes. So instead of having to, again, assuming I'm a row store, pollute my buffer pool and, and bring a bunch of data in for, for this attribute, I could just do vertical partitioning where I split it up, almost store it as, a, as like a virtual table, if you will, and then have that be stored as a separate partition and managed separately in, in, my, in my cluster. All right, so you could do this, but you still want to do like you know to, to separate the 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 two the you know, the two portions of the of the of the table, but you still want to do horizontal partition, which we'll see in the next slide, because I was maybe I want to can distribute the tuples across different partitions as well. All right, so horizontal horizontal partition I think we covered also for parallel databases earlier. But this is what again what most people think about when they think about distributed database, how to divide things up. And again, if you say sharding, this is what typically people this is what people mean. And the idea here is that we're going to choose some column in our table that is going to be a going to distinguish the, the tuples enough and, and distribute across our partitions so that we get even load across the uh, across across our, our compute nodes. Right? That like there's no one hot spot partition ideally. Can't, it doesn't always work if you have like if everyone's going to get a, you know updating a single key, you can't you know, you can't distribute that. That's going to be within a single partition, right? But that's that's not always the case. So the three ways to handle partitioning are there's actually four. There's round robin. We we could ignore that. Uh, hashing is pretty common. You basically pick some column, take the value of every single tuple, hash it by something, like a hash table, and then you decide what partition it's going to go to. Range partition we we've, we've seen before. We set some kind of uh, some some continuous range of values, and you say that that's all goes to one partition. Another range goes to another partition. Predicate partition is where you can basically put a where clause expression to determine what partition some, something's going to go to. And you're almost like manually assigning, say, like you know where where name equals Andy and age equals something, go to partition one. Where name equals Andy and age equals something else, go to another partition. Right. That's, that's not as common as hashing and range partitioning. Uh, hash partitioning is probably the, the most common one. And most of the NoSQL systems are going to do this. All right, so let's go back to our example here. So the first thing we've got to do to do partition, we've got to pick a partitioning key. And let's say, for whatever reason, this one is the one we want to use. right? And if we're doing hash partitioning, we then take the value of every single tuple, hash it by some hash function, and then mod it by the number of partitions that we have. And that's just going to determine you know, where the different tuples go. And so the ideal query for this, this scenario here is if you're doing a lookup with an exact value on the partitioning key, because now I can take whatever value you passed into this query, hash it using the same hash function, modify the number of partitions, and then I know exactly where the, the data you need, the, the data the query needs. So. That was so that so this example here going back, this is physical partitioning because I'm like taking, well, it's all PowerPoint slides, but like I'm saying that, you know the, the actual data itself is going to some physical lo location, but again in shared disk we don't really have that, right? We have these stateless nodes, so the idea is here is that we would just do uh, we we would logically assign different values or different hash values or or in this case a range of of tuples within our or table or database, and they would assign them to the different nodes. So now when a query shows up, like get ID equals one, my catalog service would, would tell me, oh, okay, this, this node is responsible for, for that, that ID value, and it knows how to go get the data that it needs. And the same thing for ID equals three. And then if I want to get multiple ones, 
again, I, I can then potentially go up to the one at the top and it, it can get the data for me. Yes? Is the main benefit of logical partitioning cache locality? This question is the main benefit of uh, logical partitioning cache locality uh, as opposed to what? Physical partitioning? So, like, or, like, what's the point of doing this? So, you have to do, to, in a shared data system, you have to do this because you, the, 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 the resting place and the location of the data is in these nodes here. Yeah. It's over here. So you got to decide, okay, well, if our query shows up, get ID equal three, get ID equal two, what node should be responsible for going get that data? Because, yeah, so to your point, like, if you just make it random, then anybody's reading any data, and then, like, you're just you're fetching from shared disk over and over again, and it costs more, and it's going to be slower. But if by doing this local partitioning, you're potentially pinning the data here on this node, so any query that shows up, you're, you're more likely to have it already in your cache and not pay the penalty going to disk again. Okay. Yes. All right, so I'm gonna, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip. We've already discussed physical partitioning a bit. But it's basically the same idea that like, you keep track of like, you know, where the data actually physically is located on the nodes. All right, so going back to my example here, what's the problem with this approach? If you're doing hash partitioning. Yes. He said, he said sequential scan. Well, yes, that's one, right? If I have a, a, a range scan, uh, you know, get part, you know, get start, select start from table where partition key between this and this, if it's hash partition, you can't do that. What's another problem? How do I scale out with this? Right? Add a new node. What do I need to do now? I got to update all my hashing to now mod by five. And that sucks because that's going to move data from, from, from you know, basically reshuffles the entire database system. So that is one advantage of range partitioning. But now how to figure out the range, that's not tri non-trivial non as well. Right? So there's actually a way to handle this, which is really clever. Um, who here has heard of consistent hashing before? No. OK. About, about half, but it's more than in previous years. Um, so consistent, partition, ha consistent hashing is a really neat technique. Uh, it was invented by in the early 2000s at MIT um, in this project called Cord. Um, and basically, what it's going to allow us to do is it's going to allow us to do incremental uh, addition and removal of nodes in our in our cluster using hash partitioning without having to rebalance everything. And a bunch of different database systems are, are going to take advantage of this. So the basic idea is that you have this, say, this, this, this ring of, of, of locations of where a key might exist in, 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 your, in your database, right? And let's say I have three partitions, P1, P2, P3. So now if I want to do a lookup, say, find me key one, I would hash it uh, and, and produce a value between 0 and 1, and I would end up at some location in my ring. And then now all I need to do is just have some kind of metadata, some lookup table to say, OK, at, for this range for on my ring, what's the if I go clockwise, what's the next partition I'm going to find? So if I land in the middle here, I, then I know that the, the, data, the, the partition is going to have the data I need is on, is on P1. Likewise, if I hash key 2, I land in this part of the ring, then I know the slider go around clockwise, and I find P3. Right? So the way to think about it is the, 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 these colors here co co uh, correspond to the sort of the range of hash values that these P3 has from P3 here all the way back to P2 and so forth. Right? So far, that's nice, but that's, that, doesn't, that doesn't solve our problem of how do we actually add new partitions. Right? So what the ring provides for us, because it's, it's circular, is that we can introduce a new partition somewhere in the ring. In this case here, we had P4. And the only thing that we need to reshuffle is any data that is now managed by this partition here along the ring. So it only has to do with P3. So now all the data from, from, you know, from P4 over here to P2 in the ring that used to be on P3, P3 has to send over here. And I don't need to move any other data in at any other partition. Right? Likewise, I got to add P5 here uh, and, P, and P6 here. And then it just changes the, the, the range at the, the, of the values that correspond to a given node. So now what's interesting and we'll see about this we'll see next week is that you can actually use this ring also to, for replication. Meaning like if I save a replication of factor of 3, 
meaning I want, I, want to, I want to have three copies of any key or any tuple I write in my database. I want, I want th three copies on, on, or three copies on, on different partitions. So if, so if I do a write into P1, I just follow along the ring and find the next two partitions along that range, and I'll make sure I write the data there. So now if a query shows up, say I want to find key, key 1, again, I, I could get actually data from either P1, P6, or P2, because they're the, 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 the three closest ones clockwise in, in my ring. Now there's a bunch of games you can play about like, OK, if I do a write, uh, and I do well, the replication factor of three, should I wait for all three nodes to, to respond with the correct answer or, or acknowledgement that they did the right? Or maybe I can just maybe, maybe just get a, a majority? Because if I do a read, should I wait for all three? Should I ask all three nodes in my ring? Or is one of them coming back? Is that, is that good enough for me? Again, this is how the, we'll see this next week, the, in, in, when we do transactions, like we don't have to have full consistency or strong consistency. We may be OK with things eventually getting propagated across different nodes. Right? And again, this is what the NoSQL guys do. So there's a, there's a bunch of systems here that, that use this. This is actually a technique for databases. The original idea was, was, was developed at MIT in 2000s. Um, and they had a sort of distributed hash table called Cord. Um, but this famously was, was used in databases and in, in, in Amazon in this, this key value store called Dynamo. It's a paper in 2007 that talked about how they were using uh, this approach. In the follow-up paper in 2022, they, they didn't say, OK, when we, we took the research system Dynamo and made the commercial version DynamoDB, they dropped consistent hashing. Right? And they, then they use a, uh, the hierarchical replication scheme that we'll, we'll see next class. But uh, a bunch of these systems use this. And actually, React was a NoSQL no system. They went under six, seven years ago. But you can kind of see in the logo here, like there's the dots of the ring and the replication stuff because they're using consistent hashing. Snowflake doesn't do this for the catalog. They use FoundationDB, which is a fully transactional key value store for the catalog, but they use consistent hashing for caching of of in their shared disk architecture. Right? They're using they're using consistent hashing to do logical partitioning of of the metadata where things are located. Um, and the Cassandra is, is probably the, the most widely one that, that does this as well as cache base. Okay. So we'll talk more about transactions next class. But the, the basic big challenge is going to be do we, if a transaction shows up, we look at our metadata service, a catalog service, and try to figure out what data they're going to need to access. Uh, and then we're going to use that to figure out whether it's a single node transaction or only touching one partition, which is the best case scenario, because we only have to check data within that, that single node. Um, or if it's a distributed transaction, meaning we're touching data at multiple nodes or multiple locations, then we got to run distributed concurrency control and a consensus protocol to make sure that everyone agrees that this transaction was allowed to commit, allowed to make the changes that it made. So we'll ignore replication for today, and then next class we'll cover how we actually want to handle that as well. Again, I, I showed replication and consistent hashing. Like I, I do a write to my database. I want to have like you know some number of copies uh, to make sure that my 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 data is always available, even if there's a crash. All right, so. For uh, if we want to support multi, you know, multiple operations on on different nodes, then we need some way to again coordinate the execution of that transaction. And the basic two approaches is that you can have a sort of centralized coordinator that acts as a, glo a global traffic cop that has a complete view of what's going on at any any time in our in our database system, or it could be decentralized and let the nodes organize amongst themselves and talk amongst themselves to figure out what transactions are they running and who's allowed to commit at what time. Most of your distributed databases are going to use a hybrid approach where it's going to be decentralized, meaning uh, that there isn't going to be one dedicated machine or node that's going to be the traffic cop. But since it's slow to do dis distributed or decentralized uh, concurrency control, they're going to elect a leader uh, that's going to temporarily be the traffic cop, the coordinator, and decide whether transactions are allowed to commit. But if now that, that node goes down, then you do a new, new leader election and somebody else can take over. And again, the spoiler is going to be we're going to use Raft or Paxos to, to do that election. So I'm going to go through, through different approaches, different examples of how you do these, these decentralized, decentralized approaches. And then that'll segue into how do we then coordinate transactions next class. 
So the first example, or the earliest examples of doing distributed uh, transactions uh, was a centralized approach using what is called a TP monitor. Um, I'm assuming no, most of you have not heard of a TP monitor. Uh, I think the original T, the, the, the original, you know, the, the, what, it, what it stood for was, I think, te originally telecom processing monitor, but that nobody refers to it as now. So now you just say it's a transaction processing monitor. But think of it as like it's a separate server, a separate daemon running somewhere that can coordinate transactions across uh, different nodes. And this was built in the 1970s, 1980s, uh, because there wasn't really, as I said, in the early days, there wasn't a, you know, this, this, a you know, single distributed daily system that was aware of different nodes and things like that. People sort of cobbled things together. And so they would build this TP monitor as a separate system uh, that then could then coordinate transactions across different disparate database systems that didn't know that they were doing transactions in a distributed way. It just saw something that they, they thought was a client telling it you know, whether to commit or run a query and so forth. So the most famous one of these TP monitors is a system called Sabre. This is built by American Airlines back in the 1970s for all like uh, running transactions across different, different databases for uh, doing airline reservations. And there's a bunch of airlines that all still use Sabre today. If you ever wonder why it's really slow to like book airline stuff, because it's running on shit from the, from the 70s, right? Um, in the 1990s, there was a movement to try to standardize the protocol for what the, how these TP monitors could talk different things. So this is called OpenXA or XOpen. Um, and again, most of the enterprise systems that, that, that none of us in this room can afford, like Oracle and Teradata and, and, and nonstop, they're all going to support this, this protocol. But it, it's, I think actually Postgres might be able to support some subset of it. Um, but this, this is how they, they, you know, they were going to have a standard API f to have these uh, to have the, to, to coordinate these TV monitors. So let's see an example here. Again, I'm not saying whether it's a shared disk or, or a shared nothing system. It doesn't matter at this point. Right? It just matters like, OK, we have these partitions. Assume that it, they can't talk directly to each other. How do we actually coordinate transactions? So say if, if I want to have a, a transaction that wants to touch data at these three partitions, again, assuming we know how to go to our metadata service to figure out what data we want to touch, the application server goes to the coordinator and says, hey, I want to lock data at, th at this partition. And the coordinator is going to have its own local lock table, just like you have on a single node system that knows about all the different partitions uh, in, in the, in the, that are in the distributed database. And assuming now we, we just do incorporate the entire partition. So it'll go ahead and you know, say running two-phase locking just as before and acquire the locks on, on, on that data, gets back an acknowledgment to the application server. Now the application server can send whatever queries it wants to the different partitions to do whatever it wants to do. And then when it's done doing those updates or lookups, it goes to the coordinator, says, hey, I want to commit this transaction. The coordinator then communicates to the different partitions and says, hey, is this thing safe to commit, yes or no? And then if yes, then we get back an acknowledgment. All right? So as I said, this, there was a bunch of old systems that, that, uh, that are still predicated or still use this, this technology. Uh, BEA had this thing called Tuxedo from the 1980s that Oracle bought. 10 years ago or 15 years ago, uh, that was a TP monitor. TransArc was a came out of the AFS, AFS projects here at CMU, uh, and then they they did they did a spin it off as a startup. It was acquired by IBM. If you know Jeff Eppinger in in the software engineering department, like that he was the he was the founder of that company. This is a it's hard to read, but it says OMID O M I D. Uh, this is uh, it's a T, it bas they don't call it a TP monitor because that's a data term, but it was a, it was a centralized transaction coordinator to run H-based transactions uh, that was developed by Yahoo Labs a few years ago and it's still around today. All right, what is more common is to use this middleware approach where the, there's some software, some service running in between the application server and the, and the, the database system itself. And so the application communicate directly with the, the partitions of the nodes. Everything has to go through the coordinator, right? So you send query requests. Uh, the middleware maintains its own lock table, just like the, the TP monitor. And then it's responsible for sending the, acquiring the locks, sending queries to the different partitions. Um, and then when it's done, you get the commit request. You know, it's responsible for going to the, to the different partitions and say, hey, am, am I allowed to commit, yes or no? All right. So I mean, there's a lot of commercial systems that, that do this now, uh, but this is, this is how Facebook scaled out MySQL back in the day, right? Because MySQL couldn't do distributed transactions. They put a middleware thing in front of it. Or Google did the same thing with, uh, uh, with, their, with using MySQL for ads. 
uh, if you're familiar with the, the tests or the, there's a startup called Planet Scale, that's how they did transactions on MySQL for YouTube. Right? So YouTube runs on something like this, right? Th th this is very common. All right, and then the last one is distributed, uh, decentralized approach. Again, where there is no middleware, there is no global transaction coordinator, uh, query shows up, or, or a request to start a transaction shows up at some partition. How that how I decided to go to there versus another one, you know, it depends on what's in the metadata. Um, it says the leader node for this transaction, and then it may query request to different partitions. That, and then at some point, it's going to go to the, the, the leader and says, hey, I want to commit. And then the leader is, er, is responsible for coordinating with other, other, the other nodes and deciding whether this is allowed to come in or not, yes or no. And again, we'll go in more detail of this uh, next week. All right, so I'm going to show you a, I'm going to expose you to this idea of federated databases. I don't think it's, a, this actually it probably is in the textbook. It's an old idea. Um, I just want to show this to you again to see that as an example of like, you can start doing some really interesting thing with distributed databases where it may not it may not be the case that the 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 all the nodes in your database are from running the same software from the same database system, right? I sort of mentioned that with the the TP monitor stuff was like these just disparate systems were being cobbled together and we're using TP monitor to decide how to coordinate transactions on them. Uh, but the idea with federated data databases is that you, it's almost like the middleware approach where you put something in front of the database systems that can make it look like it's all a single type of database system, but underneath the covers, it's rewriting queries for you, right? And the reason why we want to do this is because in a lot of organizations, when you guys go out in the real world, a lot of companies have a, have a ton of different databases, right? Because some guy in some corner of the, of the company that nobody's paying attention to built a little app internally using Mongo or whatever because they thought it was cool because they saw it on Hacker News, and it was fine when he, if he was just using it, but then his, his buddy started using it, and other people started using it. Before you know it, half the company has to use this application, and now, you, now the company has to support Mongo. But never mind, they've, they've been using Oracle or Postgres for years, and now you know, they have a bunch of new databases that have to support. So at large companies, it's, it's never homogeneous. People choose different databases all the time. Uh, and now you have these different data silos, and ideally you want to have a single view of, of, of all your data, and federated databases are one way to do this. Right, so the idea is it's going to be a distributed architecture using a middleware approach. Um, that is going to expose to the application a single logical view of the database. Even though underneath the covers, you know, maybe something storing stuff as JSON, something storing stuff as, as relational tables or whatever. But ideally, you want your, your, your application to only have the right queries against one, one data model. So as, as I said, this is an old idea. It goes back to the 1990s. Uh, nobody does this really well. Uh, and nobody, nobody does this as efficiently as you possibly can because it's sort of like the lowest common denominator. To support one system well, uh, you want to be able to push down as much of the computation as you can, the query itself, to that, to that single system. But you may not be able to be able to do that based on query semantics and other issues. So you've got to pull a bunch of data to the centralized coordinator. Then you're joined there, do whatever you need to do. Because right? the different database systems can't talk directly to each other. You always have to go through the coordinator. So let me go through an example here. Say I have four different databases. My query goes to this middleware. And the middleware is responsible for, for sending, dividing that query up into the corresponding queries that they need on the different database systems. And then they get the results back on the middleware, and I put it all together. Right? But again, the key idea is that the, we have a single logical view uh, to the application of the database, even though it's spread across different machines. So again, it's like a distributed database that's doing partitioning. It's just that we now have to do some extra work to make it look like it's all unified, even though it's not. So if you ever look at the database literature, these are going to be called connectors usually. Um, Postgres farm data wrappers can be used for this. Uh, there's this uh, distributed OLAP system called Presto. Then there's a fork of it called Trino that came out of Facebook because people didn't like Facebook or something. Um, but they have a bunch of connectors to the different types of systems. And again, in some cases, they can do complete query pushdown. They can take a query, push it down, tie it to the database system that, that has the data you need. In other cases, they have to copy a bunch of data back up, then do processing there to produce the answer that you need. Okay. All right. Last two slides. Again, quick preview of what, 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 what you're in store, store for us next week. So we already said this multiple times. We may need to allow multiple transactions to execute uh, simultaneously across different nodes in our, in our system. 
And we need to make sure that when they go to commit, that we make sure that everyone agrees that this is allowed to happen and that it looks ideally that the, the changes are happening atomically, even though they're spread across different machines. Right? It was hard enough to do this on a single box, but now we have to do this on, on multiple machines across different data centers. Uh, that's challenging. So replication we'll talk about next week. How do we, if we have the data in different copies of it in different locations, how do we make sure that they're all in sync? Uh, the, the network communication also can be expensive. Nodes could go down. And it could either be permanent, like the, the machine catches on fire and it's never coming back, or like it, or like there's a pause because, you know, the the GC kicks in or the 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 disk starts defragging or something stupid, and, and then messages get delayed, or something stupid like someone trips over a wire and pulls it out and they plug it back in and it comes back online and has to figure out what's going on, and now maybe it missed the last like 30 seconds of transactions. What should we do, right? And then clock skew will be a big issue when we start talking about timestamp ordering because. How do we make sure that everyone agrees that this is the right time stamp when a transaction wants to commit? Because again, you can't use a logical counter always because now, like, you know, how do you make sure that everyone's, you know, plus one at the same time? And you can't maybe use a physical clock because the, you know, there's there's gonna be drift and skew on the, the actual hardware itself. So it's really hard to make sure that clocks are actually in sync. And, I, and the spoiler is gonna be the way Google handles handles this with, with spanners that they put atomic clocks in the data center and they use that to get the time, make sure everything's in sync. Or they, they get the time from the GPS satellites. They use that for, you know, when they run transactions in, in, in their database, which is amazing. Uh, nobody does that. All right. So again, we'll, we'll cover Spanner next week. Spanner is probably, the, in my opinion, one of the most advanced transaction database systems. Uh, Google did a lot of amazing things in that. Um, took them a while to get there, right? Like there's, they, they did a bunch of NoSQL crap before, but when they actually built a, a, a you know, fully transaction data system, they were well ahead of everyone else. It's really fascinating. All right, so let's see why this is hard. Here's how, here's how we want to do, see we want to use two-phase locking. So say we have two different application servers uh, and our, our database is partitioned into two, 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 two pieces here. So application server one wants to set A to equal to two, application server over there wants to set B to equal to seven. That's fine because I can take locks on those, those that data, and for this first transaction here, he doesn't need anything. Coordinate, and, and vice versa, going the other way. But then the challenge is going to be if I want to start uh, in my same transaction, the first guy wants to update B, and the other guy wants to update A. Now what's the problem? It's a deadlock, right? But now it's a deadlock over a wider network potentially, and I have to figure out who's going to kill what to break the deadlock. Well, I can have a waste for a graph as we as we did before, but where is this thing located? Is every node maintaining its own waste for a graph? Is there a centralized coordinator? And what if one of those nodes goes down? You know, say I decide, oh, this one's the younger one. I want to kill this this transaction to break the deadlock, but then that node goes down and doesn't get the message, and it comes back up and still think it has the locks. What do we do? All right? There's gonna be no magic bullet to, ha to handle this. It may oftentimes just like, okay, I waited long enough. You know, full steam ahead. Let's go. Or maybe the case of like, okay, well, I, I, the majority of nodes I can't reach, I can't talk to. So I'm assuming I have a split brain, meaning I can't see the other side. So I'm going to stop running any queries until things res get resolved and I come back. All right. So this is what we've discussed next week after, after the break. Again, the main takeaway from all this should be that this is all very, very hard to do. And that in most cases, people do not need, most people don't need a distributed database. Replication is a separate issue. We'll, we'll handle that next class. But most people don't need to scale horizontally. Like 99% of the databases are like 10 gigs, 20 gigs, maybe 100 gigs. But even then, it's not going to be that big. And the cases that you do need a distributed database, well, there's a lot of these cloud services like Snowflake or BigQuery or whatever, like they'll handle all this for you. And you don't have to manage it yourself. Transaction stuff is still very hard uh, for OLAP because it's there's other challenges, but coordinate the concurrent control stuff is, is less of an issue there, right? Because you're not making a bunch of updates all the time. Okay. All right. So next class: distributed OTP systems, replication, cat theorem, and then we'll talk a little bit about some real world implementations of systems. Okay. Question: Yes. Uh, yeah. So in a shared disk system, do we still, uh, given that the storage is far away from the compute, do we still use plotted pages or do we use something else to? This question is, in a shared disk system, 
because given that, that the storage is far away from the compute nodes, do we still use a lot of pages? For OHP, absolutely yes. All, all, all the stuff we talked about doesn't go away. Yes. Okay? All right. Hit it. Shit is gangsta. Gangsta. Bad boys are gangsta. Y'all ain't nothing but gangsta. Yeah, yeah. Now listen, I'm the poppy with the motherfucking hookup. 28 a gram, depending on if it's cook up. You ain't hit a mob yet? Still got you shook up? I smack you with the bottom of the clip and tell you, look up. Show me where the safe's at before I blow your face back. I got a block on taps, the feds can't trace that. Style is like tamper proof, you can't lace that. The Dominican, or you could call me Dominican. Black skelly, black leather, black suede Timberlands. My all black 38 is send you to the pearly gates. You get consignment trying to skate, and that's your first mistake. I ain't lying for that cake, your fam, I see you wake. My grams is heavyweight, then ran through every state. When they ask me how I'm living, I tell them I'm living great.